you know, that's what we desire and we, we want more than anything in the world. Would you just help me right now? I want you to just lift your hands and honor God. And it's, I want you to just say, Lord, I'm here tonight. I want you to be the center of everything I do. I want you to be the center of this service. Lord, we're asking you to touch and by your anointing, the Holy Spirit, we're asking you to meet with us in a mighty way. Lord, we're believing that we've come together in your house tonight on purpose. That we've come to touch the hem of your garment. We've come to press in, Lord, where the presence of God will meet with us. We haven't come here to fulfill a, an obligation to our weekly church attendance. But God, we've come here tonight to meet with you. We want to be in your presence and stand in the middle of what you're doing in this world today. We're wanting to be, God, vessels of honor, meet for the master's use and prepared for every good work. Would you touch by your Holy Ghost tonight? Would you minister right now? There might be needs in this building. I want, if you've got a special need, your hands are up, but if you've got a special need, would you just wave at me? You say, I got a need, man. I want God to do something. I'm believing the Lord to touch you right now. I want you to lift that other hand right there beside you. And I want you to ask God, just call out. You've got to expect the Lord. And you've got to have a spirit of expectation. And you've got to know he's ready to move. He's ready to do a work in you right now. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we're believing you for a touch by your grace, by your power, by your goodness, your forgiveness, as the songs that was sung earlier. Lord, all of those things, the power and the presence of God, we're asking you to touch with a healing touch. Lord, I'm going to add in a need that I learned right before church. Sister Peggy Goodlow is in need of prayer. She's been admitted to the hospital this evening. Touch her. Minister God to her need and touch her life physically. Let her feel the touch right now where she's at and let the power of God just touch her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. And Lord, every need that's represented in this house tonight, we're just asking you to touch. Meet with us, Lord. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost of God be right here in our midst and we thank you for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everyone together said amen. Would you do me a favor? I believe, you know, there's an old, old saying in the church years ago that we can actually push the devil out by our praise. How many of you believe that the praise, I mean, number one, the Bible says God inhabits the praises of his people. But I believe whenever we get in the middle of just praising and worshiping God and having a, just a feeling the power of God and just giving God glory and honor, I believe the devil just kind of runs out of here. I'd like to see the devil run out. Wouldn't you like to see that? I mean, I'm not saying he's sitting on the front pew, but he's here to distract, of course. So would you help me? Let's worship and praise God right now. tonight. I love, I love the ministry of the songs that were sung and the spirit behind that, the anointing that was behind that, and I'm so thankful for that we've come together on a Sunday night to worship God, and you're, you're a good looking crowd. When I was sitting over here, I was just looking kind of over here, and I was just like, well, where is everybody? But by the time the choir got in, and I looked back behind me, all of you are sitting over here tonight, so it's good to see you tonight. Makes a difference when you're here. It helps all of us. So I appreciate that. I'm going to read from 1 Kings chapter 18. I've entitled the message for this evening on Sunday night, On Top of Old Smoky. On Top of Old Smoky. But we're not going to the Smoky Mountains, and we're not going to visit any fountains tonight. But we are going to go to Mount Carmel. And we're going to look at something that I believe we need to be, you know, every now and again, you know, our brother talked about evaluating. We need to evaluate ourselves. And we did that this morning with our communion. But we need to evaluate ourselves constantly when it comes to where we are with God. Because I'm telling you, it's not just for us, but it's for everyone else that we have influence. And we can make an impact on their lives. And it's because we need to evaluate ourselves so that we are part. I want to, How many of you want to be a part of whatever God is doing in the last days? You want to be a part of that. I've got, a, I've got grandiose ideas. I've just got this idea that this 102-year-old church, that God wants to use us in these last days. 
I'm believing you wants us to make a difference in this community. I want it to be that when the Lord comes and all of us are raptured out of here, I want Middletown to go, where in the world is Stratford Heights? Where in the world are all those people? And where are the prayer partners and the prayer warriors and the people that are ministering and meeting needs in our community? I want to make a difference. I want us to be so careful to evaluate and examine our motives, our vision, who we are as a church. I don't ever want to come together and just see you and have fellowship and decide where we're going to eat after church. Although those are good things, especially eating. But I want to be a mission. I want to be on purpose. I want the fire of God. I want the presence of God. Somebody put out a book years ago, Brother Rick Warren, and it was a great book because it gave purpose and meaning to our lives. It was the purpose-driven life. But something got a hold of me in that, and, and I started saying, yes, Lord, I want to know my purpose. I want to, and I read the book, and, and I thought it had some good points in it, and I think we had a small group study on it, and it was all right. You know, I know, I know somebody says, well, they're not the same denomination we are. How many of you know there are no denominations in heaven? How many of you know that? And I guarantee you, there's going to be some Baptist folks, Presbyterian folks, and some Nazarene folks, and some First Church of God folks. They're going to sit down, and God's going to just tell them what for, what they had right and what they didn't have so right. And then he's going to say, now where is that Cleveland, Tennessee bunch? Where is that Church of God, Cleveland, that Pentecostal bunch? Get over here. He's going to sit us down and tell us where we didn't have it all together, and we weren't exactly right in all we were doing. What's important is that we love Jesus with all of our heart and that we're searching him out, searching out the answers and as much wisdom as we possibly can. And we join together with our brothers and our sisters of every, every church looking for the things that bring us together. And what I've found with my Baptist friends and my Presbyterian friends and, and a lot of the folks that in, our, in our community, what I've found that come, we come together on is the fact that Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, rose again from the dead, and that he is our redeeming Savior. We have that in common. But I think some of the things, some of the, some of the very thing that I'm, I'm wanting to preach about tonight that I believe is missing in today's church to make it vital, to make it essential to the work that God's doing in the community is that we need to evaluate, Cindy, whether we have the fire. We need to fire. And when I say the fire, I'm, ta I'm not talking about uh, running around and everybody doing jumping jacks. I'm not talking about, you, know, you can, do you know you can have fire and be someone who just sits quietly on a pew and intercedes quietly to yourself, but yet you can be lit up and fi on fire for God. I'm not talking about an outward demonstration. Although I've met some folks and seen the way the Spirit moves and it's awesome. But I'm talking about a fire, a fire that brings change, a fire that brings the presence of God. I want to know my purpose, but I started praying and preaching a, do, a new message back then. I started saying, Lord, I want to know my purpose, but I want to be a presence-driven church into my purpose. Presence of God, amen? I'm going to read the scripture and let's just sit down. I, although I have to stand the whole time. Okay, I didn't see anybody out there who empathized. Wow. All right. 1 Kings chapter 18. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Can you say amen? Father, by your Holy Ghost, will you speak and minister? Challenge us into another level tonight. So we've come together in your house on this Sunday night. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Elijah's one of the great models in the word of God concerning the fire. The fire. Fire has always been a symbol, clear back to Old Testament times, of the presence of God. 
When I talk about wanting the fire, wanting the fire in my life or wanting it in the church, again, I'm not talking about a particular style of worship or a particular kind of denomination or, or gathering of people. I'm talking about the presence of God. I want to sense and feel and see the fire of God's presence in my life and in the life of this church. It's always been a symbol in the Old Testament and in the New of the approval of God. When the 120 were gathered together, Brother Warren, in the upper room, they were praying until they were endued with power, and that came in the form of fire. Fire has always consumed the sacrifice or consumed the, the offering that was given. It showed approval and acceptance. Whenever God off, accepted an offering, fire fell on it. Whenever God accepted a sacrifice, fire fell on it. We find in Hebrews chapter 12, what does the Bible say in verse 29? It says, our God is a consuming fire. He's a consuming fire. He, that means when God comes on the scene and he touches our lives, he literally takes all that we are. He takes everything. He's all consuming. He is everything. Man, he takes, when he took my life over and I really meant business and I wasn't just trying to please my mama or trying to please my Sunday school teacher, my youth pastor at the time when I was young, when I was really after God myself, when God accepted my praise and accepted my repentance and he accepted my, my sacrifice and surrender and coming to him, he, he accepted me with fire in my life. Fire has always been something that shows the acceptance of God. Malachi said this about Christ. He said in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 2, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a launderer's soap. You know, that launderer's soap, if you do a study on what in the world that means, it kind of just means that he's bleach. He's like bleach, man. Whenever he comes on the scene, he changes everything. He turns it upside down. God is a consuming fire. The spirit of burning is the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 4. Many times in human history, God visited his people with fire. We remember Moses, you know, in the land of Midian in the backside of a desert when he suddenly turned to see a bush that was burning, but it was not consumed completely, but it was burning, meaning he was an all-consumed bush. A voice spoke out of that flame, and this is what the word says. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. The point of that scripture in my reading tonight is this. God spoke to him in the fire. It was in the fire. And I know that worked not only in the Old Testament, but it works in our lives too. You want to hear God speak. Many people are, are, are interested and de de desirous to hear the voice of God and to know what he's saying to the church or know what he's doing or saying in your own life. Let me tell you, you want to get to where you can hear the voice of God Get underneath that fire spout of heaven and you'll hear from God. Let the fire fall. He needs people who are a flame of fire. God speaks out of the fire. And he's called us to be a people of fire. He's called us to be a people who are consumed with his power and his work. It was John the Baptist who told folks, man, I, I baptize you with water into repentance, but someone's coming after me who's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That fire is what brings miracles. That fire in our hearts and in our lives, that's what brings the change and the transformation in our lives. It's the fire of God. I want to challenge us to a desire for the fire. A desire for the fire. When Abraham went up on the mountain with Isaac, going up to Mount Moriah, Isaac said to his father, he said, Father, here here I am, son. And then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? 
You know, I read that, and you think about what that means for today. See, if you heard that kind of being talked today, you'd say, well, we know we have the Lamb of God. We know the Lamb has been provided once for all. The sacrifice for all has been given and done. So we have the wood, and we have the Lamb, but now we want to know where's the fire. We want to know where's the fire. Where's the fire in our churches? We've gotten cute. We've gotten pretty. We're good with our programming. We're good with our, our look and our the way we light up things and the way we do things. And, and, and churches are real real attractive to the world right now. And there are a lot of other churches in, in our community that are packing them in. I mean, I know a church not very far from here who had a Super Bowl, big Super Bowl Sunday. And, and they had three or four kegs for their Super Bowl party. Not very far from here, Liz. Not very far. I don't say that to condemn and judge them. I'm not, I'm not interested in getting up here and ripping other people apart. What I'm saying is I, I, want, I want God to be pleased with what we do, and I want to live a life that I believe reflects the word of God, and I don't believe we're to look as much like and chase after and try to be so attractive to the world. I still believe that there is a holiness in the life of those who have found the fire of God and that we've got to live that out in our walk. We can't live it in our own strength. We can't live it in our own program. We can't make it pretty enough for the fire. We can't talk good enough for the fire. We can't sing good enough for the fire. It's either there or it's not. And you know when the Lord shows up in fire? Not when our program's just right. He comes and shows up when our lives are reflecting a surrender to His power and the work of His Holy Spirit. God sends fire. He wants the holy fire to fall. God wants to, to give his Holy Spirit to our people. He wants us to be saturated and on fire with his spirit. When Moses was giving the law on Mount Sinai, the fire came down on the mountain and it quaked. And the, the whole mountain was covered in smoke. And, and the, the Bible says there was an earthquake that was there. And it's so much that it scared the people, the Israelites who were standing down. They told Moses, they said, no, you go meet with God. We, we don't want to do that all oh, for a spiritual fear and a reverence once again for the fire of God. I don't want to preach holiness to run you off. I don't want to preach about the fire to run you off. But I sure would love it to entice you and to draw you in. I'd love to get to the place where there would be such an attraction again for the supernatural power of God instead of just the programming and the free cars and the free gifts that we want to give out these days. I wish there was a hunger once again for revival. We used to get in cars and chase revivals and we'd show up at one church and go to another church and be at another one the week after that. When I was young and I was in love with God and just freshly saved and filled with the Spirit, I'd find revivals to go to. I'd go to one church one week, another church the other week. I'd be down at Pike for two weeks for Perry Stone and come back up here for two more weeks. I'd be in four weeks of a revival as I was young and I remember searching out trying to find somebody else that was in revival. I couldn't get enough of the fire. It used to be that the fire of God was the attraction. It was the thing that drew the people in and that's when you saw the quaking and the smoke and the, the power of God that filled the temple. I remember when we would sing under the power and people would fall out in the pews. I I remember Judy Jacobs singing one night at Harlem Park and the power of God, the anointing was on her so strong. The fire of God had completely consumed her and she went like this and waved her hand across the audience over at the Harlem Park building and I saw it with my own eyes. I was there as a young man to witness what I saw from the time she started over here and made her way all the way to the other side. People began to get out and jump up and start moving and shouting and running the aisle all the way down and across the building. It was something spontaneous, instant. Nobody had a meeting to say, hey, let's make it happen. They just knew the power of God was in the place. The fire had fall, and they were there and knew it. Oh, Lord, we need the fire tonight. We need the fire, Lord, in the house of God. We need once again to, Lord, be more concerned with our surrender and the emptiness of this vessel that we might be filled with the empowerment of your Holy Ghost. That's my prayer. I hope it's yours. That's my prayer. I want to see more. I've, we see miracles here. 
This isn't a condemnatory message. We are seeing miracles here. We're seeing people touched by the power of God and healing in their bodies. And we're seeing lives that are being transformed. I love looking at people with testimonies that, you know, one week they're one way and they get saved and turn around. I, I had a testimony. A young man got married the other night and, and we were getting ready to walk out there, and, and he was just getting ready to get married. I mean, you would have thought that would be the only thing, Jim, that was on his mind. And I'm, I'm standing over by him, and we're getting ready to walk out. And, and he, I'm th I said, are you nervous? And no, no, man. He said, there's something I want to share with you. And I said, okay, well, what is that? And tears welled up in his eyes, and he said, I just want to thank you for the church. And I said, well, that's awesome, man. And he said, no, you don't get it. He said, I was as far away from God as I could be. He said, I didn't want anything to do with God. He said, I was a character. He said, I was on the wild side all the time. He said, I was bad to the bone. And he said, and I came because I met a girl. He said, and that girl went to your church. He said, I slipped in on the back pew. And he said, that first Sunday, I sat there with my mouth open and was awestruck. He said, I couldn't believe that the God that I'd heard about my whole life was real. And he was in the house. And I heard about him and saw him. And he said, I want you to know it's changed my life. He said, I told my wife-to-be. He said, I told her the other night. He said, I don't care what else we do. One thing we will not do, and that's give up Stratford Heights Church of God. He said, that's where we're going to raise our family and that's where we're going to be. He looked at me and he said, I want to thank you because I believe that the preaching and the ministry and the worship of your church, he said, it turned my life around. He said, I don't want to be wild anymore. I don't want to be bad anymore. He said, I don't even know what happened to me. I just know that I want more and more and more of God. And I say, oh, thank you, Lord, for that kind of fire, all-consuming fire. It has nothing to do with the church. You know that. It doesn't have anything to do with the preacher. We're smarter than that. We know that people don't come to God based on all of those things. They come to God only if they know that he has met them right where they live. And if he brings a change and a transformation into their hearts and lives, then they're ready to trust him. People are still hungry for the reality of God. People are hungry for the reality of God. They want to know him. They want to know that he's real. They want to know that the power of the Lord is real. There can't be a firefall without there being a demonstration or a manifestation of his power in the lives of his people. That's what I want to see. A manifestation of God's spirit. There are certain, there are certain stories in the Bible that we read about it, we talk about it. If we say someone's name, you'll immediately you connect them to an event that took place in the Bible. Noah, what do you think of? The flood. Abraham, Isaac. Joshua, Jericho. David, Goliath. Daniel, Lion's Den. Elijah, Mount Carmel. The fire that fell on the altar. That place where he went, you know, a lot of people don't know this. You have to study a little deeper into the story. But Elijah was, you know, he had his ups and downs. And that's what I love about Elijah. He's a lot like us. You know, some days he's on the mountain. And other days he's hiding in the cave. And other days he's hiding under a tree praying for the Lord to just let him die. He is a normal human being. Did you know that? He wasn't an extra, extraterrestrial being. He wasn't a robot, a transformer that came out of a, a movie, a blockbuster. He was a man. Elijah was a man who had been called by God to be a prophet and to go and to preach the, the words of God and to tell the, the, the good news of, of God's work in the Old Testament time. He was just a man, an ordinary man with a calling on his life. But oh, an ordinary man was able to experience extraordinary things, right? And you and I have that assurance. That's the first lesson. The fire of God can rest in our hearts and lives and we can see mighty, miraculous and wonderful things take place in our lives. A lot of times people point at the pulpit and they point at the stage 
stage and they think this is where all the action takes place. Can I just tell you, there's as much fire in the pew tonight as there is up on the pulpit. There is more fire in the hearts and lives of people of God than there is in many pulpits around this country and this world. When you understand that he's no respecter of persons, I look up to God a lot of times and I, I one time I said, Lord, there have been men that have been close to you in the word, men that loved you so much, that walked so closely with you that you took them. Elijah was one that he took up in a chariot of fire and Enoch was another that he just took up one day. He was just walking with the Lord and took him up. Did you know that there is a closeness, there is an intimacy that you and I can have that could almost make it like we could just step on over into the other side. Oh, I'm looking for the fire of God to fill my life. I want that surrender in my spirit. I want that kind of surrender in my life. I want to live that out. I'm sorry for wherever I've been, wherever I get human, and, and maybe you've seen attitudes out of me, or you've seen me acting real normal. I, you know, I guess I can't help that, but I want to tell you tonight, I've got a grand desire tonight. I want to love like Christ loves. I want to live like he promised I could live in his word. I don't want anybody in that word of God, those normal, average, everyday people, I don't want one of them to outlive me when it comes to serving God. I don't want any one of them to have a better experience than I have had I not because I care or think I'm anything but I know I'm just as good a son as any other son and you're just as good a daughter as any other daughter and we ought to get ours and stand in that place of reception with God how many of you are ready for the fire of God in your life tonight I want to be I would want to live my life like if the Bible was being written right now they'd write about my life is that all right? Is that, that's not egotistical and arrogant, is it? That's a desire. God's a writer. <laughs> I like that. The Bible says we're living epistles written and read by all men, right? Your life is, is an open book. Your life is a living example that Jesus Christ is real. That his power is real. I love the way he chose that Mount, that Mount Carmel. The way he chose that. Because you see, Elijah was so in love with God. And he, he was, this was like the, one of the pinnacles of his experience with God. Even though he was a young man at this time. Younger than he would be later. He, he literally, he, he was at the, the pinnacle of some of the greatest moves and experiences with God that he had ever had. And as he chose, he, he looked over and, you know, he, you know the story. He, he went to, to King Ahab and he told him, There's, you know, y'all have turned to Baal. You've, you're worshiping idols and gods, false gods. And he said, God is displeased. There's, it's not going to rain, not until I give the word. Boy, you know, you know, it amazes me that at, when Jezebel came after him, that he found himself under a tree praying to die. Because other times he was as confident as he could be. I mean, he had the, he had the audacity to walk up to a king, Thomas, and say, um, it's not going to rain until I say so. I like that. And boy, Ahab said, well, is that right? And I'm sure he didn't think very much about what he had to say until they went into a drought and didn't have any rain for three years. And then after all of that, man, he, you got Elijah hiding out in the brook Cherith, and he's hiding out at the widow's house, and the miracles are happening there. She's finding out that the flour and the, and the oil won't, it just will never stop. And, and then the son, is pa the son gets passed away, and, and he raises him from the dead, and all this stuff has happened in secret kind of while he's staying away from Ahab. But then it all comes around. One day the Lord speaks to Elijah and says, it's time for you to go back to Ahab and tell him, Go back to him and confront him. And he did, He does, and he goes to him and confronts him. And when he does, King Ahab says, oh, you that troubles Israel. And King uh, Elijah looked at him and had such a confidence and such a such an anointing on his life. He said, oh, no, it's not me that's troubling Israel. Let, let me just be, let, let's be aware of what's really going on here. It, it, we are not the problem in our community. The church is the problem only when the church is silent and does nothing. But the church is not the problem. The church is, is trying its best to live out the holiness and the wonder, wonderful uh, 
precepts of God's word. But when you understand, he looked at me and said, I'm not the problem. He said, you're the problem. You've been living wrong. You've been following after Baal. You've been living, you've set up these temples and these altars of worship. And you've torn down the altars of Jehovah. And because you've done that, look, it, it's time for us to just make a decision. It's time for us to, to get everything out on the table. It's time for us to make a final proclamation about who is God. Just who is the real and living God. And so then the contest is on. And Elijah picks Mount Carmel. When he picks Mount Carmel, it's interesting because Mount Carmel was like the highest mountain in that area. And it, if, you, if you controlled Mount Carmel, you pretty much controlled the entire northern kingdom. And so it was like a massive kind of thing to go to Mount Carmel. And plus, Mount Carmel was the place where the, the Jehovah altars had all been torn down and, and the Baal, the altars to Baal had been erected. And there was a place of worship for, for Baal up on that mountain. So when, when Elijah chose Mount Carmel, he wasn't choosing a safe place. He was choosing a place that would be a challenge. So you thought it was just the altar that he made challengeable when he when he got up there and said, you know, and we'll talk about in a minute how he put the 12 stones around it and dug a trench and filled it full of water with four pitchers three times. That's 12 barrels of water, and he did all that. He was literally, from the very beginning, he was making it very clear, God's got this. God's got this. So when he chose Mount Carmel, he went to that high mountain and chose them to meet up there. They had the 400 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherel, and they're all up on top of the mountain. And when they're there, they're all, you got the prophets of Baal and the world screaming and crying, trying to prove their God is real. And that's exactly what's happening. I, I saw something the other day. Now, I'm not trying to, I'm not getting into to, to this. This is not a message for tonight. But I went by the, the Islamic Center down here off 75. And, and as I was going, I could not believe the cars that were jam-packed in that place. Literally surrounding the building in every way. There must have been seven, 800 cars. Maybe a thousand cars that was literally jammed all the way up to the fence. They were in the grass all the way back around. I looked at all those cars and I thought, my Lord, there's got to be a revival in Cincinnati. There's got to be a revival because that is like those prophets of Baal. They're out there and they're praying to their false god and they're praying to their false religion and they're they're praying and they're going through all their rituals and all their things and you know I'm not scared of them what I am is I'm sorry for them because they've not discovered the one who gives life and life more abundant they've not they've not discovered yet the living waters that come through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ they've not yet discovered that there is life in the prince of peace and the mighty god the everlasting father Jesus Christ they've not discovered that yet and so I I prayed for him as I drove by and looked at that, that parking lot. And I prayed for him since several different times. And it really grieved my heart that people are buying in to all kinds of different philosophies and all kinds of false ideologies and deception. But when I think about this story here, I'm reminded of that as I go up on that hill. And it's one man against 800, 850 if I remember correctly. One man against 850. And it may feel at times like you're all by yourself. It may feel at times like there's no one there to help you. It may feel like sometimes you don't know what's going on. And there, you're, you're standing in a, in, in a valley all by yourself. And you've got the, you know, it, it was, there's several different places in the word where they felt like they were all alone. It's always been this way in history of the church. It's always been this way. David stood alone as the entire army sat back and shaken in their boots when the Goliath, the giant, was standing in front of them. But we see all of these things and we understand and we know that one is a majority when you are with God. God and you are, an, are a majority. You and God can do anything. You and God can walk on water. You and God can accomplish many tasks and miracles. One man, one man called out to Lazarus in that tomb and he came out. Now granted, that was Jesus, but it was one man. And all throughout scripture we see one man. And so here's Elijah standing up on top of that mountain. And he's one man with the fire of God. One man with the anointing of God. One man with the calling of God. And there against 850 people. The Bible says they were dancing around, cutting themselves, chanting, trying to make a big deal. And anybody walking up on that scene would say the popular vote says that the prophets of Baal win. The prophets of Baal have a mighty protest going on. And they are, are much bigger. And this is a 
a much more organized situation and those folks have got the money, they've got the programming, they've got the temples and they've got all the power. But you know, it was one man filled with the fire and the power of Almighty God standing up on that mountain that literally made it as difficult as he possibly could so that people would know your life may be hard. Your life may, you may have gone through some things that others have never had to go through and you think, why me, Lord? But I'm going to tell you something, the harder it is to save your life, the greater the testimony it is for where you go out and represent him on the streets all over this community. Don't, don't, don't ever let it, the enemy or anyone ever hold you back because of where you've come from. Let God use you and empower you and fire you up to be used by his spirit. You know the rest of the story. He put that altar, he put 12 stones representing the tribes of Israel. He dug him a trench and poured 12 barrels of water in there and just looked up and said, God, let it be that they'll know that you are God. And the fire came down. And I love when it's the real fire of God. Because the real fire of God, Jay, comes from God. It doesn't come from what we work up. You and I light a fire anywhere. To, I mean, we, we can be holy, Cindy. We can walk on. We can think we're... We're just accomplishing all kinds of feats. We can think we're the biggest, baddest Christian ever walked on the face of the earth. But we're going to light a fire. It's going to have to come from the bottom up. I light the wood. It lights the sacrifice. Or it lights whatever. You know, the grill. It, I light it down here. It goes up. Fire goes up when a man is in charge of it. When a man is making it happen. But when God's fire comes, it comes from him. And it comes down. The fire falls from heaven. And when it comes, it comes down on the sacrifice first. You see, God isn't interested in your talents and your abilities. That's not where it's at. He's interested in the sacrifice. He's interested right here. He burns here before he ever burns here. He burns here before he ever burns out here. He touches here before he ever will ignite your ministry and anoint your words and your music and your talent and your abilities. He won't ever anoint your work before he anoints what's in here. The fire starts here, burns all the way through to the sacrifice, and then, and then it comes out into the gifts. Is this all right tonight? Say amen. You're a little quiet and you remember what that means. I love I love the story of Elijah, but there was a, a little bit of a problem with the people. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 20, going on with the story, it says, So Ahab sent for all the children of Israel, this is before the fire, and gathered the prophets together on Mount Carmel, and Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. It says, But the people answered him not a word. Now granted, we know that when the fire finally came, it says they all fell on their faces and declared that Jehovah is God. But the problem that we have a lot of times, and this is where I'm coming to a close tonight if you want to get ready to help me, the indecision of the people when the confusion and the chaos is all around, when the world is just going on, the indecision of the people they answered him not a word. That's the indictment against the people. These were the people of God. You and I can't be silent. We can't be quiet. We can't sit back and let everybody else do it. If we're going to touch this community, if we're going to touch our lost loved ones, if your sons and your daughters are going to be saved. And is it all right if I say this? I'm praying for your sons and daughters. And you ought to be praying for their sons and daughters. Well, my family's all in, praise God. Well, great. That means you're free. That you can start interceding and praying and being anointed to touch the hearts and lives of somebody else who's, who's staying awake late at night because they don't know when, what time they're coming in or they don't know where they're at. Oh, my family's all fine. I'm all good. No, you're not. As long as the family of God is still in suffering, as long as we're all hurting and there are lost loved ones among our ranks, then we are all in this together. 
long as there's a husband that isn't saved, the women ought to be getting together and agreeing and believing and praying and asking God to bring a salvation to that home. Can I get an amen? As long as there's a wife that isn't saved, the men ought to be coming together for that brave man who's coming to church faithful and he's serving God and yet his family is not with him. We ought to pray until we see the fire come down. The fire will bring the change. We need the fire. We need the power of Pentecost. I believe in the power of Pentecost. I'm not saying I believe in the power of the church of God, although I love the church of God. I wouldn't be a pastor in the church of God if I didn't love my church. I love our history. I love where we've come from. The anointed hand of God has been on this great church since the first time eight people met together in a schoolhouse down in North Carolina. The power of God has been with them. So I love them. I love the independent churches just as much. But I'm called to work here. And I'm called to work out of this channel that God's using. And so I pray for us. But we're not the ones. We're not the ones that God is looking to, to answer all the questions. He wants us to be a part of the ministry and the work that's happening in the world through His Holy Ghost. And His Holy Ghost knows no denominational barrier. The Holy Spirit doesn't know any walls. He wants us to pray for one another, intercede for one another, live out this fire of his Holy Ghost in the hearts and lives of all community, all of our people, making a difference and seeing it come to pass. Do you believe that tonight? I want to see that powerful work of God. I want to see a mighty, mighty move of God. I want to continue to see it. You say, but pastor, we have great services. I know, isn't it wonderful? I'm thankful that we see the move of God. I'm thankful that we see the power of God. But I haven't seen no chariots waiting on us. So I figure we've kind of got a long way to go. I haven't seen anybody walking out of here and poof. Well, there went Elaine. I saw Elaine before service. Anybody see her afterwards? No. She was there and then he took her. I don't want that to be something that, that makes us feel bad. I want it to be something, Debbie, that entices us, challenges us to move in to a deeper, more intimate place with God. There's a long way to go. We've all got a long way to go. And the awesome thing about it is that every step of the way, he's giving us power to overcome. He's giving us fire that will help us. And you know what I love about God? There's not like this end-all destination with him. It starts right where you are. He empowers you, blesses you, touches you, uses you all along the way. And everywhere you go, it's like you get a whole new, fresh, wonderful opportunity to be used of God, empowered by God's Holy Ghost. When, when they sing it tonight, they, they want to sing under the anointing. They want to sing to make a difference. They want to sing about invitation and coming to Jesus. You know, this, this is one more opportunity tonight. They'll get another one next Sunday. They'll get another. You and I will get opportunity after opportunity. I'm preaching tonight, but next Sunday I get to preach again. And I want to pray between now and then because, you know, this was an important day in the history of our church, but next week is more important than this week was because next week is now. Next week will be now. Now, and it'll be the time. And what's happening in this service tonight is important. What you're feeling right now is important. And whether the Holy Ghost is touching you and challenging you and helping you challenge you to move into that deeper place, it's now that's very important. I used to say to the choir, I'd go in before service and pray with them, and I'd say, you know, today is the most important day in the history of this church. And they'd be like, no, no, I remember a revival back with Perry Stone. We were here till 4 in the morning. Laying, people were laid out on the floor. All over. Pastor, that was the greatest. No. Today, right now, is the greatest, greatest service, greatest time in the history of our church. You know why? Because it is right now. It's this fresh and wonderful opportunity to do an amazing thing for God, to be used by God. You and I are right here in this few hours, maybe a few days, who knows how long before Jesus Christ looks over and Gabriel is stepping out on that cloud. I don't know which one it'll be, but he's stepping out on that cloud. And Father God is going to look at him and say, go ahead. 
And can you imagine the cheering in heaven when the angels of God are cheering and screaming and running to the balcony of heaven? They're, I want a front row seat of the rapture of the redeemed. I want to see it happen. I can't hardly wait. Are you, are you sure tonight that you remember and that you know it's going to happen just any minute, just any hour? And oh, that's something to get a, to stirred up a joy in our spirit and an anticipation for where we're headed. We ought not to worry about our conversations. I heard somebody say the other day, well, I don't want to make people mad, you know. I don't want to cram religion down their throat. and I don't want them to feel like I'm just trying to be a Jesus pusher. I looked at him and I said, do you want him to go to hell? Do you care enough about hell and the demons of hell that are fighting for them every day and the devil's work? Are, are you... Do you, are you concerned enough, worried enough about that that you'll tell people the truth? Act like you've got some kind of a power and a fire inside you that can't be shut up. Now there's a graceful, wonderful way, an anointed way. You can't change nobody. You ain't got no power to change nobody. But the fire that's in you. That fire, man, people love to come to a fire. Have you ever seen a fire, a neighborhood fire, and people are like, honey, there's a, there's a house that's burning over you, and let's go see. They all just get in their cars, and they got a, a, a traffic lined up. Everybody wants to see a fire. I'm telling you, if you'll get consumed with the fire of God in your heart and life, people will come just to watch you burn. People will come just to see what's inside you. Stand with me tonight. I hope I was able to, Lord, I hope by your spirit I was able to get across what I feel in my heart tonight. The people answered him not a word until they saw the fire. Well, I think we ought to pray for the fire like Elijah did. And the fire doesn't come down on the altar anymore but now it comes down on the individual on the child so God wants to fill you full he wants to consume you with his fire he wants to touch your getting up in the morning and you're laying on your pillow at night he wants to touch your life he wants to use you at the grocery store wants to use you at the office wants to use you walking in your neighborhood he the Lord will anoint you to where your neighbors will look out their windows just to see how you live. And that's okay. As long as you and I have the fire of God. Father, touch us tonight. Touch us by your spirit. Let us have a great desire, Lord. For the fire of your presence, the fire of your power. Lord, we want, to, we want to live in that expectation of the fire of God, evaluating ourselves and examining our minds and spirits so that we live out, God, as much as we possibly can to the nth of our own life, to the very ebb of it all. We want to live to honor and to bless and to be empowered by you. I pray that you touch every heart, every life tonight in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to join me in spending time tonight in this altar. Just to find a place there at your seat or here at the altar where you can just spend a few minutes in prayer asking the Lord, Lord, touch us with your fire. And if you, you feel like you, you haven't got that to pray for, then pray for me. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Pray for somebody. Pray for the lost. Pray for whatever you can tonight. But would you come and let's spend a few moments in a season of prayer in this altar tonight. Fire burning deep. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fire burning deep. Consume me with your Spirit. Burn in me. Burn in me. Burn in me. Burn
in me. Fill me with your holy presence. Fire burn in me. Consume me with your spirit. Burn in me. your fire fall, Lord, let your fire fall on me, fire burn in me, fill me with your Holy Spirit, fire Consume me, holy fire. Consume me with your fire. Consume me with your fire. Consume me with your fire. Consume me with that fire. Consume me with your fire. Holy Spirit, move and burn. Send your fire down, Lord. Send your fire down, Lord. Send your fire down on me, Lord. Send your fire down, Lord. Send your fire down, Lord. Send your fire down. I want you to pray for us. Oh, Father in heaven, how we love you. Lord, we witness your presence tonight here to each one of us. You have come to us in our hearts. We can open our minds and our hearts and our souls to you. And Lord, you have cleansed us and you have helped us tonight to see that we want to be closer to you. We want to live closer, Lord. 
We want to do like our pastors preach tonight. We want to have your fire burn in us so that when we're out in the world, we can help bring in the lost. Help us to see people, Lord. They're all going to live somewhere forever, and they need you. So anoint us now as we go, Lord. Don't let us be the same. Anoint us every day as we live for you that we'll reach the world for you because that's what you want for us. Anoint us with our families and with our people we work with, strangers that we meet. Holy Spirit, draw us and anoint us now and keep us. Thank you for this message, Lord. Thank you for our pastor. Lord, we love you, and we know he loves us so much. Thank you for someone who cares and loves us to preach us the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. While these continue to pray, thank you for being here. Go and make it a wonderful week, a great week in the Lord. Let him use you, and let's come back Sunday just as fired up as we can be. Amen. God bless you.